My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a great day and a great week as well. Uh, before we get into the message this morning, uh, we have someone that we want to say thank you to and recognize because she has served for 35 years in the We Care ministry. 35 years ago, Pastor Lee Toms. How many of you were here under Pastor Toms? Quite a few of you. Asked Donna Hollingsworth, to lead the We Care ministry, and she said yes. And she is stepping down from that ministry, and we're having a celebration at the end of the service for her. But she's in the audience. I, I saw her earlier. Donna, you have to stand up, all right? Just stand up. We want to say thank you very much for all you've done. <clears throat> That, is, uh, that has been one of those ministries that you may not even know about unless you were a widow or a widower, and Donna has served faithfully. And so we want to thank you, Donna, for all your hard work and your faithfulness uh, to us, to Arcade Church as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, thank you for music. Uh, you could have created this world with Monotone creation. We just hear one note and that's it. But you created us to mix notes together and instruments together to form melody and harmony and lyrics. And it's just a way that we can be able to articulate to you in music what we may not be able to do without it. So thank you that we had the pleasure and privilege of lifting our voices to you. You are indeed holy, holy, holy. We praise you. We thank you for all that you've given to us. And we know that you will be with us through the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Well, you may agree with what Nick was saying about the Ten Commandments, that it's a heavy, heavy time for you. And I, I get that. When we're talking about stuff we should be doing, Sunday in and Sunday out, it can weigh on you a little bit. And so I, that's why I would recommend that you continue to preach the gospel to yourself. And each time we talk about these commandments, I do want to do that a little bit. And so the question I have for you, I think it's in your notes, is what place do the ten occupy in the Christian life? What place do these, these commandments, what do they play in the Christian life. And I'd say this, the Ten Commandments reveal our condition without Christ. They reveal our condition without Christ. Where would we be without Jesus? We would be standing condemned before a holy God because we have broken his law. In fact, I'd say it this way, the law of God is meant to lead us to the grace of God because if it doesn't, we face the wrath of God. You see, folks, we're not saved from Satan. We're saved by God, for God, from God. It is his wrath that we come under condemnation. And if the law of God does not move us to the grace of God, then we are subjecting ourselves to the wrath of God. That's why this, this is a big deal. If you're not a Christian and you've been coming and you've been coming Sunday in and Sunday out and hearing about the Ten Commandments, what you should be doing, what you shouldn't do, and all, and all the, the things that ought to be happening in your life and all you're walking away with, I just need to try harder, you've missed everything. 
because the Ten Commandments were meant to reveal to you who you are, where you're standing is before God, but then also the Ten Commandments define our obedience to Jesus. How many of you, you may still do this, I don't know, how many of you have heard of WWJD? How many of you still wear the bracelet, the little wristband? Not many. I, I thought that was a great campaign. But do you know what the answer to the question, what would Jesus do? The answer is, live by the Ten Commandments. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. That's how he lived. And so when we talk about what would Jesus do, what we're saying there is that we live by the Ten Commandments. And here, here's what happens. Go ahead and put your palm out like this, if you would, please. 100% participation, even for the Democrats. Come on, you can do it. Come on. Okay. 100% participation. This is you. This is the Ten Commandments. This is the law of God pressing down on you. And if you've been feeling the pressure of God's law pressing down on you, and if you're not a Christian, I thank God for that. Because he's revealing to you, he's proving to you that you are in desperate need of him. Because that law is pressing down. But once we come to faith in Jesus Christ, it is no longer law that comes down on us. What comes down on us? Grace. We're not under law in Christ. We are under grace. So what happens to the law? The law comes underneath us and moves us towards perfection, moves us towards Christ-likeness. What would Jesus do? He would live by the law. He would live by the Ten Commandments. In the New Testament, in shorthand, love God, love your neighbor. And so for the believer in Jesus Christ, the law no longer presses down on us. It comes underneath us and lifts us up and answers the question, how do I obey Jesus? Ten Commandments is a great place to start with that. Well, here we are in Exodus chapter 20. If you haven't turned there, would you please? Exodus chapter 20. And what we've done all the other seven or eight Sundays that we've been here, I'm going to read the entire text. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Well, there we have it, Father, your, your law. And Father, if we fall under that grace, may we take whatever guilt we feel, whatever shame we feel, and go right to the cross. Because there, this perfect Savior took upon the penalty of our sin and paid for it. And so now we are no longer under your law, we are under your grace. But now we, may we look at your law as simply a way that we can be able to obey you and love you and draw near to you and our neighbor. Thank you that you have forgiven the preacher of his sins for there are many. 
In your son's holy and precious name, Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Amen. So here it is. You shall not steal. This is the eighth commandment. If you were raised Lutheran, it's probably the seventh. If you're raised Catholic, it may be the ninth, depending on how it is. For us, it's the eighth. You shall not steal. So the question that we've got to ask ourselves is why in the world is stealing wrong? If we're just a bunch of cells glumped together, if we have just evolved over billions and billions of years and all we are are nothing more than animals, then why in the world do I or anybody else have the right to say, you shall not steal? And obviously our biblical worldview is not built upon the theory of evolution. It is built upon the truth that there is a creator who has designed and he is intelligent and he is holy and he is beautiful and he has made us in such a way that we worship him. And so he has the right to tell us what we are to do and what we are not to do. And so why is stealing wrong? And we're going to talk about this very, very quickly this morning. And if you want to get into some conversations about that, that would be great. I would love that. The reason why we do not steal is because we have been given the right to own property. That seems kind of basic. Theology 101 But what you are wearing right now is your property. What you drove to church this morning is more than likely your property. And you will go home to a place that is very likely your property and sit on furniture that is your property. God has given us that right. It goes all the way back to creation. He created Adam and Eve and he said, I want you to be fruitful, but I don't just want you to be fruitful. I want you to steward. This is yours. I'm giving it to you. You own it. So build, paint, create, draw, compose. Do what I've created you to do. It's yours. It's your ownership. Later on, he does the same thing with the children of Israel as they're going into the promised land. This is the land I am what? Giving you. I'm giving you this land for you to own. Judah, your tribe, you're over here. This is your land. Reuben, this is, you're the tribe, you're over here. Simeon, you're over here. Zebulun, you're over here. Naphtali, you're over here. This is your land to work. And he's given us this right of personal property. And so the reason why stealing is wrong is because he's given us the right to own property. These are my shoes. These are not your shoes. You don't want these shoes. I've had them for 10 years. They've been everywhere. (laughs) But if you take these shoes, these are my shoes, you've stolen shoes from me. And that's what happens. And so when we steal, we are taking from someone else what God has given. If God is the originator of property, ultimately these shoes are mine, but they've been given to me by God because I spent them with money that I could be able to produce and have a paycheck to buy these things, and God gave me that life because he's given me this heart to beat and this brain to think and this body to live. And so everything, directly or indirectly, he has given me. And so when you steal from me or when I steal from you, We are stealing ultimately from God. We kind of said the same thing in a side door way when we're talking about murder. You're not just killing a person, you're killing an image bearer of God. You're killing one of his image bearers, one of his creation. This is why we do this. And so when we steal, we are taking from someone what God has given. How many of you have had something stolen from you? Raise your hands. What was it? Just shout it out. What was it? Come on, keep it. It's got to be more than that. Yeah, get it off. This is really good for us. Get it out. Get it out. Yeah. How many of you had your house broken into? Our house got broken into when we were at prayer meeting. That's just not right. How many of you had your cars broken into? 
We've been burglarized, we've been vandalized, we've had our cars broken into. That's all happened in the last several decades of life and, and we recognize that. And yeah, they, they, they stole things that may be precious. When we got burglarized, they stole some sentimental jewelry that was from uh, ancestors gone by and that was hard to go. I don't remember what it was, it was so long ago. But what, what really bothered us was what? That we felt, violated. you all know, violent. You just, man, it just, ugh. I mean, it just, it feels weird. About a month ago, Debbie, who's my wife, in case you don't know, Debbie, she's in the kitchen. And in, in our kitchen, you, you look out over our backyard. There's a sliding glass door and you look out over the backyard. And she's doing stuff in the kitchen and she looks up. And there's a guy walking around in our backyard. No idea who he is. Not a clue as to who this guy is. She's looking. And so what, did, does she call 911? No. She grabs our dog. <laughs> Man, let the dog go. Let him go. No, but, but she gets it. And she does call 911 because there's this guy. There's no repairman. There's, there's no one supposed to be in the backyard. He's just walking around kind of staggering. And then he finally makes his way to the front yard and walks away. It turns out he was jumping fences for our neighbors who have pools, just taking a dip in each pool as he goes through. <laughs> it's progressive swimming. <laughs> and no harm, no foul. But man, since that time, as a month ago, wasn't it like that? Since that time, you're kind of going, man, that's just, you just, you feel shaky. Someone was uninvited on our property, our property. And we feel that way. Well, if you're taking notes, we're going to go through these rather quickly. Two types of stealing. We're going to break this down like everything else. We'll find out probably that we too, without Jesus, we would stand guilty before God because of thievery, because of stealing. There's two types of stealing. There's wrong taking. What's yours is mine, I'll take it. And there are even different types in this category. What's yours is mine, I'll take it. There is in your face stealing, where it's just blatant. It's, it's right there, it's measurable, it's in your face. Let me, I, I typically don't give you stats, but I'm going to do this because they kind of blew me away when I was doing some research on this. Here's a bunch of numbers. This is by the National Association for Shoplifting Prevention. It's too bad we have to have an association of that, right? But we do. Get this. Last year, $13 billion was shoplifted from merchants in America. 13, that's $35 million a day. $13 billion. Get this. One out of 11 Americans admit to shoplifting. So, in your pew, <laughs> count down, and that 11th person, it's you. It's you. Now, this might be where you think, oh, hey, it's a, it's a piece of gum, it's a, it's a piece of candy, it's something like that. No, no, no. This $800, this is what the average shop, the average item that is shoplifted costs the merchant. $800. Every item stolen costs the merchant $800. Oh, we're not done. <laughs> Department of Commerce. The Department of Commerce is there. $50 billion. Businesses, corporations have lost $50 billion by employee theft. Oh. Better put that pencil back. 75% of Americans admit to stealing things from their company. 50% of this number say they do it repeatedly. Now that might be, well, that's a post-it note, it's a pen, it's a piece of paper. Oh no. The average theft by an employee in the United States among this is almost $2,000 worth, uh, worth of stuff that they don't own, the employer owns. This is what blew me away. One, this is back in 2020. One out of three businesses have failed because of employee theft. One out of three businesses. That's a sad, sad commentary. I got this from Saturday Night Evening Post. It's an old magazine that used to come out. It just cracks me up. 
This is by Ann Thasher. She's the artist of this. You'd think it'd be Norman Rockwell, but it's not. It's Ann Thasher. And notice, here's a butcher. And look, he's got his, you can't tell it very well, but he's got his finger. He got his finger on the scale, weighing this down. The gall of that guy to do it that way. And how cute that is. But then here's this cute little old lady, and she's got her finger underneath the scale, pushing up. And that's what we see here. He's pushing down, make it heavier. She's pushing up to make it lighter. I think that captures a lot. We laugh at that. We think that's cool. We think it's funny. But the truth is, that is so destructive to a culture. That is so destructive to a culture. So that is in your face stealing. But then we've all, oh, oh, we've got this. This is behind your back stealing. In your face stealing, but now behind your back stealing. $66 billion, corporations and businesses have spent this much against cyber warfare. Cyber stealing, cyber theft. They spend $66 billion a year just to make sure that no one can steal anything from their documents. 16, this is 2017, 16.7 million Americans had their identity theft stolen. And it cost them $16.8 billion. 20, in 2021, 20% of Americans had their identity stolen. And this 50 cents here, I, I, I double checked this and I couldn't believe it. 50 cents will buy you someone else's credit card on the dark web. If you want to spend 20 bucks, you get the credit card and the CVC code. So theft has become part of our culture, even in this back, behind your back stealing that you really can't measure, you really can't think about a whole lot. But then there's another kind of stealing, church campus stealing. You know who you are. <laughs> this is a problem, you guys. I mean, we, we, we put things in there, we, we have paper products, and we've got all kinds of things, and all of a sudden we get ready for an event, we go to the cupboard, we know that we supplied, it's gone. Why? Because someone said, this is my church, this is my stuff, I give to it, I should be able to be entitled to it. How many of our garages have chairs and tables with the name Arcade Church? It might even say Arcade Baptist Church. It, it's been in your garage that long. It happens, it happens. And so if that's you, we're gonna launch a brand new program and I know you're gonna be excited about it. It's called the ACAP. ACAP, for this week only, we are launching our K Church Amnesty Program. <laughs> and so if you've got stuff, a coffee pot, if you've got a chair or a table that you've meant to give back but you took it back in 75, it's not yours. You've stolen it till you bring it back. It's amazing how many Christians break the Eighth Commandment with their own church. If you use paper products or if you stole some food from the fridge for your own event, then just go ahead and put the cash that it would cost in an envelope. Don't put your name there because we're not going to give you tax credit for something you stole. <laughs> but go ahead and put that in there. It's a problem. It can be a problem. So that's wrong taking. What's yours is mine, I'll take it. But then there's also wrong keeping. What's mine is mine, I'll keep it. What's mine is mine, I'll keep it. And this breaks into different kinds of stealing as well. Stealing by not paying properly. For those of you who are employers or business, you, you, you want to get bargain basement for your employees and you pay them such. They're providing you work in a fair market and you're paying them below fair market. That is not indicative of a person following the Ten Commandments. It says this in James chapter 5, verse 4, Behold the wages of the laborers who, mow, uh, who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And that happens. That happens in our culture. God willing, it does not happen among the people of God. But then also, oh, and, the, and cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Stealing by not working hard. I'm not going to hit on this one very long because I'm going to mention it towards the end. And so we'll just move on. But we are stealing from our employers when we do not give them a fair day's, way, a fair day's work. 
stealing by not caring for parents. There's an interesting passage in the book of Proverbs that I think is, is very unique. Whoever robs his father or his mother and says, that is no transgression, is a companion to a man who destroys. That's not a sin. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping from I'm not going to take care of them. I'm keeping for myself. You're robbing your parents. You're stealing from your, your parents. Stealing by not giving to kingdom ministries. And this is where if you've been around church very long, you're thinking, oh, here it comes. Exactly right. Yes, here it comes. We are stealing when we do not give to kingdom ministries. I almost said the local church, but there are all kinds of wonderful ministries that are indirectly connected to the local church, but they're not the local church. One of them for us is APC, Alternative Pregnancy Center. Stealing by not giving to kingdom ministries. God calls the nation of Israel out on this in Malachi chapter three, verse eight. Will man rob God? How in the world can we rob God? Yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. That's how you've robbed me. First John chapter three, verses 16 through 18. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for brothers. In other words, give, give. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. There is so much benefit in being able to give. And when we do not, in essence, what we are saying is, What's mine is mine, I'll keep it. We've been doing this since we've gotten to the last few uh, commandments and we'll do it again right now. So how would we, what is the positive side of this command? How would we state this positive? Go and talk amongst yourselves for about a minute. How would you state, you shall not steal? How would you state that in a positive way? Go ahead and discuss, all right? <clears throat> Just a few more seconds. <clears throat> all right, what'd you come up with? Go ahead and shout it out. Okay, all right, heard that. Share, okay, all right. As not Sonny and share, but share as in share. Okay, got it, all right, what else? Joyful generosity, that's one of our missions, okay. What else? Honor God's property, okay. One more. Giving, okay, giving. Yeah, we, we, we're basically all around there. This is how I would state it, and this is just how I would say, give generously. The way that we battle the sin of thievery, the sin of stealing, is by giving generously. Now, where in the world do we get that? We get this with this third kind and it's called this a better way, right giving. It's not wrong taking, it's not wrong keeping, it's right giving. What's mine is God's, I'll share it. What's mine is God's, I'll share it. And this is one of the joys I have as pastor. And if you don't know this, I want you to. The brothers and sisters of RK Church are extremely generous. This is not a problem. As a church, it may be a problem as your household, but it is not a problem as a church. Typically, I would get up here and say, man, we are behind budget. We are in the tank. We need people to dig deep and give. Don't need to do that. We're not in the tank. We're doing very, very well, and I praise God for that. And so with great joy, I can talk about this, and we're talking about stealing. And so the question I have is, how, how does a thief not become a thief? And we would think, well, a thief stops being a thief when they stop stealing. But that's not what the word says. 
Get to what Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28 says. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather, but instead, this thief who's been stealing, but rather let him labor, let him work, okay? We're right there with you. Doing honest work with his own hands so that, why? So that he can make his own money? No, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. A thief gathers, a thief gets, a thief accumulates. And now what Paul is saying is the only way that you're going to get that thief to stop accumulating is for them to get a job so they can make enough so they can be one of the contributors so that they can share. And that's one of the beautiful things about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that we worship a God who gave everything. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, give us all things? And so when this thief stops, it's not just a matter of stop sinning and do better, but stop sinning by going to work, making your own funds, so that not so you can gather, but so that you can disperse and dispense. That's how the thief stops being a thief. So... How do we obey this command? Got four suggestions for us. I hope that they'll be applicable for you. Number one, call stealing what it is and make restitution. Call stealing what it is and make restitution. Stealing is a sin. You might feel it's justified because after all, it's just a corporation. They've got plenty of money. They've got insurance to cover it. That's not a problem. They're not going to be penalized. It doesn't matter. Slice it and dice it however way you want. When you take something that's not yours, that is stealing. So call it what it is. It's sin. And then make restitution. How, what that looks like, I don't know. But make restitution. There's a couple of places in Scripture that are interesting. For example, in Exodus 22, verses 1 and 2, they're being educated, they're being told that part of the law, part of the law of not stealing is if, if you do steal something, the punishment of that is to pay back five times, to make restitution five times what you stole. Not to go to prison, but to get to work because now you owe five times over what you stole. Then we also know this story in Luke chapter 19 with our good friend Zacchaeus, the wee little man. Zacchaeus Chief tax collector, meaning he had tax collectors under him. It says that he was very, very wealthy. Jesus invites himself into the home of Zacchaeus. We don't know what was said there, but on the backside of Jesus leaving, Zacchaeus says what? Just so you know, master, I'm going to give away half of everything I own for the poor. So what was going on between the time when Jesus invited himself over to Zacchaeus' house and to Zacchaeus saying, I'm going to give half of everything I own? What happened there? The law of God happened there. Zacchaeus, you've been stealing. And what does the law say about stealing? Make restitution by paying back. Then you need to do that. That's what happens. And so if you've been stealing... Call it what it is. It's sin. It's a violation, God. You've been taking things that God gave someone else and make restitution. Number two, stubbornly seek to practice the lost art of neighboring. Stubbornly. Be stubborn about this. We are living in a culture, and I I believe that we are living in a state that is the least neighborly state in the union. Maybe second to New York, I don't know. But the people of God, one of the ways that we can do battle with stealing and all the other ten, all the other nine commandments is simply practicing the lost art of neighboring. It's interesting because the Old Testament talks about this all the time. I mentioned to you Exodus 22. In that same verse, it says, or in that same chapter, if you borrow something and it breaks, what do you do? Well, you duct tape it back and give it back, you know, and... You know, why why do you own such bad stuff that it would break when I have it? No, the law, the law says if you break something you've borrowed, then you you pay it back. You either buy a new one or you give them enough money to be able to buy a new tool, whatever that is. Also in the same book, in, in the book of Exodus, there are all kinds of places. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, if your neighbor's livestock wanders away, well, finders keepers, Right? 
If your neighbor's livestock wanders away, then keep it for your neighbor when they come and find you or take it back to your neighbor. But then back in Exodus, if your enemy's livestock, get this, if your enemy's livestock wanders away, oh, this is your chance. No, if your enemy's livestock wanders away, then take it back to your enemy. Now how that translates, because most of us don't own livestock. How's that translate? What it says is, is know your neighbor, be neighborly, be stubborn in being neighborly with your neighbors. Know their needs, know their cares, know their wants, know their desires, know everything that's necessary about them, but stubbornly seek to practice the lost art of neighboring. And the passage that I love in the New Testament is a very simple one. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. How different would your street be if there was one family in your cul-de-sac or on your street that lived by this? How much more beneficial would that neighborhood be? How much more powerful and more visible would the gospel be if just one of our households lived this out with their neighbors? Seek their good. What does it mean for them to prosper? What does it mean for them to flourish? Can you contribute to that? Can you help with that? And then three, this is, I hope this is an obvious one. Develop a reputation for being a hard worker. We've been, since COVID, we all know that supply chain's down. We've all whined about it. I know I have. But we also know the labor force has greatly diminished. Now we can say all kinds of reasons. Well, the government's given people money to not work, so they're not working. Okay. I would say, Christian, go to work. Go to, get a job and, and, and go to work. I know that maybe the government can give you more, but there's a biblical mandate of us working being in motion, working together, and doing these kinds of things. You know, Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, not so you can earn God's favor, because if you're thinking that, then the law is looming over you, but rather the law is under you, and the reason why we work is because that moves us into Christ's likeness. And so resolve Resolve to be the kind of employee that you would want to work for you. Would you want to work for you? Be that kind of employee that you would want working for you. But then if you're an employer, if you're a supervisor or a boss or an owner, resolve to be the kind of employer that you would want to work for. Do we see how how the gospel plays out? The gospel plays out when People, men and women, young and old, we work. By the way, I didn't show you a stat here. Um, In the book, The Day America Told the Truth, it's a very interesting book. They stated that Americans admit to goofing off 20% of their workday. 20% of their workday. That turns out to be one day a week that Americans, Americans are cramming a four-day work week into a five-day work week. But when a Christian comes along and all of a sudden, there's no goofing off, there's diligent effort, there's work, there's striving, that will point to the gospel. When we have an employer that pays fair wages for whatever the competitive wage is, they pay fair wages and they treat their employees well because that's how they would want to be treated. That points to the gospel. It's become that conspicuous in our culture that we as Christians, we will no longer be known for our voting record. We'll be known that we are, we are people you want to have on your team. We are people that you want to have working for you. Oh, you're working for a Christian? Good for you because they will treat you well. It's become that practical in this culture and how great it would be. But then the fourth one is the most important. If all of this seems impossible, if it seems so difficult, then this is what we need. Constantly rehearse the grace of God in your own life. Constantly rehearse the grace of God in your own life. State it this way, Christian generosity was never meant to be an ought but a want. I am generous 
what God has given me, not because I ought to, he'll be upset if I don't, but because I want to. I have been overwhelmed by the grace of God. I have been given his salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has given me everything I need for life and godliness. I am a blessed person, and whatever I have is shareable because of the grace of God, not because I'm good, but because Jesus has been good to me. And so I want to do that. In fact, the Apostle Paul on his third missionary journey, he's going around to the churches that he's gone to in the past and he's raising funds. He's blatantly saying, give me money because there's a famine in Jerusalem. And the Christians in Jerusalem have all been ostracized by the Jewish community so they are literally on their own. They're probably not even living in the city. They're living on the outskirts of the city. And so Paul's going around because of famine and these Christians are starving. He's going to raise them money, give money, give money. And he goes to Corinth and he's writing his letter to Corinth and he's saying, you guys need to give. You guys are so wealthy. I want to tell you about a church in Macedonia. They were so stinking poor, I had to tell them to quit giving because they were overwhelmed by the grace of God in their life. And this is what he says in verse nine. <clears throat> For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his, own, by his poverty might become rich. The impetus for generosity, the only way that we could ever do battle with stealing in our own souls is not just by stopping, but by starting. By starting the, the thing, everything that I have has been given to me by God. And so that means that everything I have is shareable. I want to be able to spence and give because it's an expression of what's been given to me. The only reason why we should obey the Ten Commandments is yes, number one, because God has deemed it so, but because we're not, un we're not under the Ten Commandments anymore. The Ten Commandments are under us, moving us into Christ's likeness. Why do we not steal? Short answer, because Jesus didn't. Longer answer, Jesus is in us. We live for him. So it could be for you this morning, and maybe this whole series, it has been heavy on you. You have felt the guilt of the Ten Commandments. If you are not a Christian, I thank God for that because there's a remedy for that guilt, and it's Jesus. Jesus has borne your guilt. He is offering to bear that. He is offering to to take that burden away from you by you professing faith in him in his death, burial, and resurrection. And if that's you, at the end of the service, we're gonna have some elders up here and we just wanna talk with you and pray with you and maybe introduce more of Jesus to you so that you can believe in him and trust him for your Lord and Savior. If you're a Christian and you have, you have professed your faith in Jesus and you have been overwhelmed with the guilt of sin, whether it's this one or others, then I want you to come because we don't want you to leave with that burden. You came with that burden. My goodness, don't leave with it. We want to pray for you. We want to give you the gospel. We want to remind you of this incredible gospel that God has given us and how beautiful that is. So I want you to come forward as well at the end of the service. Let's stand together. <clears throat> May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, that together with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. And we all say together, for the glory of God. Have a great day. I love Thanks for watching. Find out more about the Arcade Church community at arcadechurch.com.